Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to Scaling Your Startup with MongoDB. My name is Michael Lin. We're going to let folks filter into the, into the session before we get kicked off here. Give it another couple of minutes. Welcome everybody. My name is Michael Lin. Uh, just give it another 30 seconds or so uh, as people come into the, into the session. It's great to have you here. We'll get started with scaling your startup with MongoDB in just a moment. Hey, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're at. Let's see, quite a few folks piling in. That's great. That's awesome. And it is just about three after. There we go. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Michael Lin, and I'm a developer advocate with MongoDB. And today I'm going to talk about scaling your startup with MongoDB, with the MongoDB platform. A uh, little bit of background. So um, I am, as I mentioned, a, a developer advocate with MongoDB. I've been on board about five years at, um, at MongoDB, working out of the Philadelphia area. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, at MLin. Uh, in my previous uh, positions throughout my career, I've been an engineer, software developer, an architect, and uh, pre-sales, along with um, uh, with my, my colleague, Brian, who's uh, on the line, he's going to help answer some questions as they come up. Um, <clears throat> but today, I, I focus almost entirely on the MongoDB for Startups program. And uh, that's a program that's designed to help startups succeed by giving them access to, to tools, resources, and support uh, to help them build their amazing ideas. I also spend time um, talking to founders and developers on the MongoDB podcast with my co-host, Nick Raboy. So that is, um, that is an exciting part of my job, um, delivering that podcast. If you want to check that out, it's available on all podcast networks. You can use that link there, bit.ly, WMDB pod, or just search your Apple or Google podcasts, whatever podcast network you use. Definitely check that out. As I mentioned about startups, um, we are going to today talk about some, some information that might be really interesting to you if you're thinking about starting something up, if you're maybe a founder of something already. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how to leverage the MongoDB platform to, to build on your idea. And we're gonna be specifically focusing on MongoDB Atlas, which is our online database as a service. So I'm gonna walk through what it's like to deploy a free tier instance that's free forever. You don't have to pull out a, a credit card. You can use that as much as you like. There's some limitations on that and I'll talk about those. You can, uh, we're gonna talk about adding users to that and providing access to your team, deploying some sample data so you can see what documents look like. And then we'll connect to that free tier instance with, uh, with various tools, including MongoDB Compass. This is the agenda, which I kind of just covered. Uh, I'm going to end my introduction shortly, and we're going to go into a little bit about what MongoDB is, what Atlas is, uh, being the, the online database as a service. I'll show you how to import some data, and we'll go into a little bit more technical detail there. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have time for, uh, for questions. So in an ideal world, as a developer, maybe you're a founder, or maybe you're a CTO, you, you're working really hard on putting something together. Maybe you're, you're actually developing it yourself. And if we were to look at kind of the ideal picture, the ideal, ideal scenario of uh, like a founder's 
uh, road through their startup journey, you'd have this, this level of activity on the left there, the, the Y axis, and then on the X axis, you'd have time. And if we look at that journey, you start really, you know, at the bottom and you're working really hard. And maybe at some point during your, your time, your journey, you launch your project and uh, the activity against that project is going to increase. And um, you're going to have to have infrastructure in place that will support that increased activity. Maybe there's a release or an update or a patch or something that you need to deploy and that might precipitate additional users and additional activity. This is all going to translate to, you know, more CPU usage, more, uh, probably more disk space used. Uh, and then you do another release or an update and things level off. Like this is a, this is a perfect journey to making a lot of money, right? If you're able to navigate this journey successfully, uh, you know, it could, it could essentially start raining cash on you. Um, in reality, uh, you know, we all start developing something and uh, we work really hard at that. We, we get to a launch perhaps. And, uh, you know, maybe there's an, a release or an update. Maybe things don't go so well and the, the amount of users uh, drops off. Maybe we release a, a feature that doesn't work quite well and, and things go down. And then, of course, there's rain. Sorry, that's spelled um, European spelling of, of rain. But into each life, a little rain must fall. And and this is really how, how the, the requirements for scalability turn out. And if we were to able to just deploy hardware in a data center and just keep adding hardware, you know, based on our assumption that we're going to have increased users, that'd be great. But that's not the reality. So scaling and supporting the increased and decreased in the requirements against that infrastructure is really difficult to do. Uh, you know, if it were just if it were just adding resources, that would be a breeze, and um, you know, it might be more expensive. But you know, the the increase in in the users is probably going to pay for that. But what's really tricky, uh, especially with you know some of the startups I've worked with, is when we have to plan for those decreases. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that. So that's the so what. So um, you know, in the past. I've worked at, at um, Fortune 50 uh, banking and enterprise financial firms. And, you know, back in, the, back in the 90s and 2000s, we just all day, every day, deployed additional hardware to support, you know, the growth that we were experiencing. You know, the, the internet boom, um, those days are gone. And, and now we can't, we can't really, uh, you know, those businesses are not even doing that. They've moved to the cloud to support a model where they're paying for only what they use. And that's where MongoDB comes in. So MongoDB started life around the same time that the iPhone was produced, which is an interesting, uh, interesting fact. Um, I was I taught to write code and develop software using relational databases, and many of you may be as well. When we develop software using relational technologies, we think in terms of tables and rows and columns in tables. MongoDB is a little different. We, we store data in documents in MongoDB and we refer to these as JSON-like. So you're probably familiar, if you're a developer, you're probably familiar with the concept of an object and maybe even a, a JSON object, a JavaScript object notation. That's how we, we notate documents. So JavaScript, J JSON uh, documents are really nothing more than key value pairs that you see there on the right. We've got the, the bracket indicating that we're gonna represent an array of things. We've got the curly brace inside of that indicating that we're gonna start a document. Then we've got some keys separated by semicolons or colons and a value. Where it gets really interesting is when you have embedded documents. So documents embedded within documents. That's where it gets really interesting. But I, I want to I wanna leave that on the screen and you can see that we're representing the very same data that is represented in rows and columns in a table using JSON. Now I say JSON-like because MongoDB doesn't really store JSON at the disk. What we do is we we store it using something called BSON, which is a binary representation of JSON. And it's important because 
if we were just using JSON, we would be limited strictly with the data types that JSON supports, but we're not. We support many different data types, those beyond those that JSON supports. And we do that by storing a couple of extra bytes at the end of each field to indicate what the data type is. That's important for you as a developer. That's super important for you because when you're storing a date, for example, in JSON, it's just a string. But in MongoDB, you can indicate that that's date. And that way you don't have to figure out whether you stored the year at the beginning or the year at the end or the month at the beginning or end. Uh, it's all figured out for you. And that's why we use BSON. That's MongoDB. It's a database. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an open database. You can download it, install it on your laptop. You can run it on a server in your data center. You can run it on servers in AWS or GCP or Azure. Uh, it's freely available. You can download it and run it all you like. Uh, so we, we have the very same vernacular, the, sa the very same uh, terms. Well, the terms are different, but we're actually referring to the same uh, elements in the database. If you're familiar with SQL, relational technologies, maybe Oracle or Postgres, you refer to your data elements as stored in rows, uh, rows and columns in tables. We have this concept of collections. We have documents in collections. We also support the concept of indexes. Indexes obviously speed up access to that data. Excuse me. We support joins. So in the relational world, you, you pretty much have to have joins. You have to have multiple tables. When, when I'm developing an application, maybe I'm going to store data for people and their cars. Immediately, as a relational developer, I, I normalize that data and I create two separate tables, one for people and one for tables. And I create a foreign key so I can link those two tables together. With MongoDB, you have a choice. You can do that if you like. You can use what we call, instead of a join to, to pull data between those two tables, from those two tables, you can use something called a dollar lookup. And the dollar lookup is gonna pull data from multiple collections. But what, what happens more often than not with MongoDB is you, you store data in a single collection and you embed that data. And in some, in some cases, that means that you'll, you'll duplicate data. And when, when relational developers hear that, they feel, like it's, they, they feel like it's just bad. It's just not good because there's multiple instances of the same piece of data. Not the case. And what we do is we, we leverage the read-write profile to help us make the decisions as to whether we're going to, st to store links between data or the actual embed the actual piece of data. Um, so you have a choice with MongoDB and that's what the freedom uh, we talk about when we get an additional freedom with MongoDB, that's where that comes from. Um, and then of course, at the bottom there, we support transactions. So we've, we are fully ACID compliant. Uh, so you can store and leverage um, uh, transactions as a part of your application. So now we've talked about MongoDB. Now we want to talk about MongoDB Atlas. Atlas is lesser known, but it is a, an application that we built to help people deploy and manage and secure their MongoDB instances. Like I said before, you can download MongoDB all day, every day, and deploy it on your own if you like. If you deploy, if you want a highly available instance of MongoDB, you can, you can take three laptops and put a MongoDB instance on each of those and run that as a cluster if you like. Um, but you've got to do that manually and the work associated with that is going to be greater than that than if you had a, an application do that for you. And that's exactly what MongoDB Atlas is. It's an automated solution that deploys the MongoDB instances for you on different hosts. It's available on demand. It's, it's an, the application presents itself as a, a web UI, a user interface, super easy, easy to use. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you. It's elastically scalable. Remember that um, the, in the perfect world that I talked about uh, where you've got, um, you know, you've got situations where you need additional resources. Well, MongoDB lets you scale up, super simple. All you do is change the configuration via the UI, hit go, and we do all the work behind the scenes to deploy new servers and move your data to those new servers. And then uh, essentially it's all done behind the scenes like a black box. 
but you also get the ability to scale in the other direction. So, uh, you know, in today's cloud world, we want to pay for only what we're using. And if we're only using a lower amount of CPU, shouldn't we be able to scale to that? That's what MongoDB Atlas lets you do. It is secure. It's really difficult to deploy an insecure instance of MongoDB via Atlas. You forced to put a user, you know, to use user authentication. You can't, you can't access it with, you know, anonymous uh, authentication. You are forced to poke a hole in the firewall. Um, you can do all these things. If you really want to deploy a, an insecure instance, I guess you could work at it, uh, but it is secure out of the box. It is highly available. You can't deploy a single instance of MongoDB. If you could, if you could deploy a single MongoDB server, it would not be highly available because if it went down, you would not have access to your data. But we deploy clusters for you in MongoDB Atlas, so it is highly available. And it provides automated forms of backup. So you can set it and forget it and have your, your backups take place automatically in the background. So I want to demonstrate this. Let's get to the to the to the the fun stuff. Let's open a, a terminal, and I'm going to stop my share for just a moment while I set my terminal up, so I can show you exactly what I want to show you. Then I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, you should see uh, my MongoDB Atlas screen and I'm already logged in. So I've already created a user. Um, you may see something like cloud.mongodb.com um, and you'll, you'll have the ability to, right out of the gate, create a project. Once you register with MongoDB, if you log into cloud.mongodb.com, Com. You'll, you'll have to register a user ID first. And once you do that, you're going to be walked through the process of deploying a new cluster. Now, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to click this button. Uh, you won't have to click that your first time through because it's going to bring you to this wizard right out of the, the first screen when you, when you register. It's going to walk you through the process of creating a new cluster. And again, a cluster is just a highly available instance of MongoDB. So the first question up at the top here, global cluster configuration, we're going to make this super simple today. And I'm going to leave this out of the discussion for right now. But just know that if you have an application that has a requirement to be highly available across the globe, you can, you can do that. And the process is really super simple. But again, I'm going to keep it simple today. We're going to leave our global cluster configuration at its default. And now I'm going to move on to the second section, which is cloud provider and region. Now we support, again, this is an application that lives above the cloud providers. So MongoDB Atlas is this application that I'm running in my web browser. Now to run MongoDB, we actually leverage the cloud providers. We don't create our own MongoDB data centers. We leverage the data centers that these cloud providers have. And we deploy the instances that you are deploying with Atlas into these providers. So notice, look down here in the center, as I change the cloud provider, you're gonna see the data centers change. So if I go from AWS to GCP to Azure, now we're deploying these, the instances that we're about to deploy, the cluster, into our, our uh, Azure GCP account, you will have access to them via this interface. And I'm gonna show you that. So I'm gonna keep it simple. I am in Philadelphia on the Eastern coast of the United States. That's close to, uh, relatively close to North Virginia. So I'm gonna leave it at North Virginia. Um, and uh, so when I come in here by default, I'm not gonna select multi-region or workload isolation. We're gonna keep it super simple. All of the defaults are gonna work for you right out of the gate. So I'm keeping it all at default and I'm gonna select the cluster tier. Now for me, my free forever instance is not available because I've already deployed that. So I'm, I'm kind of running a, a, like a cooking show where I've already baked the cake and there's a cake sitting on the counter. Um, I'm not gonna bake this cake completely again. I'm just gonna show you what it's like. So notice that it says M0, it's grayed out, but it says M0 sandbox 
free forever, you can select that one per project and you can have multiple projects in your MongoDB Atlas account. So for now though, I'm gonna select this M30 tier instance. M30 is just the, the model number. That, that uh, it correlates with the amount of RAM and storage as well as the CPUs. And notice we get a base price. So that's 54 cents per hour. Maybe if I don't have the requirements to support eight gigabytes of RAM, I can go back down and select the M10 and it's only gonna be eight cents an hour, okay? Now, maybe I have a very low CPU requirement, but I have a larger disk requirement. I can drag this, this disk space to the right and increase the amount of disk that I have. And notice at the bottom here, the base price stays the same, but the down here at the bottom, the hourly or the monthly estimate and the hourly charge goes up as I change the amount of disk. So again, you're only paying for what you use. Uh, and I'm, I'll go back to the M30. And here's, remember we talked in the beginning about that, that real world scenario versus the ideal scenario. This is a key here. If I select auto scale, if I select auto scale here, I'm given the opportunity to tell Atlas what the minimum tier size should be for my application. Okay, I'm gonna select minimum size. Let's say it's a, an M20. And what the maximum size should be. And MongoDB Atlas will scale automatically between those instances. So let's say we have really high hopes and we're deploying an M30. But we don't know, we don't know. It could be, maybe it's not gonna be everything we thought it was gonna be. I can say, well, I only want to go down to, in any event, to an M10. And if things get really, really hot and we get a lot of users, maybe I wanna go up to an M50, but I don't wanna pay for an M50 right away because it's gonna be really expensive. Uh, so I only wanna pay for what I'm using. MongoDB will auto scale between these two instances really powerful capability. I'm just gonna click on the documentation here and show you how we make those determinations. This is key. If you wanna scale your startup, it, it's okay to select and set these parameters out of the gate because you're not gonna be paying for what that, that maximum consumption model is. And in order to make the determination as to whether or not an auto scale operation must take place, we look at, or Atlas looks at, and there's not a person doing this, it's all automated. Atlas looks at the CPU utilization, and it looks at the memory utilization. And the algorithm is this. If the next higher cluster is within the maximum cluster size, then we say, look, if average CPU utilization for your cluster is, has exceeded 75% of the available CPU for the past hour, for one hour, or this is an or statement, or the memory utilization exceeds 75%, guess what? We're gonna execute a, an, a scale up uh, operation. So we're going to scale up to the next available uh, cluster size. Similarly, with the scale down, now this is where it changes a bit, where we say CPU and memory over the past 72 hours is below 50%, and we haven't scaled down in the last 72 hours, then we're going to scale you back down. So we want to make sure we're not frivolous in our, in our scaling. We want to make sure that it's truly a, an event that requires scaling back down. So that is really key. I want to call that out. That's auto scalability. It's built right into MongoDB Atlas. You don't pay extra for that. Um, although it is not available in the free instance, it's, it's available starting in the, the M10 and above, which makes sense because if you're, if you're, if free instance is going to be the relatively light duty. So then uh, the, the last thing that I'll, I'll click on here is the, the backup. We can um, enable backups automatically. We can also support point in time restore. What that's gonna do is it's gonna leverage the, the operation log within MongoDB. It's gonna take a snapshot and it's gonna leverage the op log to give you uh, restorability to a, a point in time. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful, especially if you wanna uh, make sure that you can restore at any point in time. Uh, and the last thing we'll do is maybe we'll change the, um, the name of the cluster and I'll call it my first cluster. And when I click create cluster, it's gonna go off and, and create that cluster. Um, maybe we'll do that. Let's let it, let it deploy. It's gonna take about seven minutes to deploy that. So rather than, than stare at 
at me while that, <laughs> while that happens. Let's take a look at one that I deployed before. And this is, I just deployed this this morning. This is uh, 0527, that's today's date. And I named it before. Uh, so let's take a look at what a deployed cluster looks like. How are we doing on time? Six, all right. Uh, okay, so it's giving us a note that we're deploying changes. That's fine. That's from the, the other cluster that's being deployed. Here we see in the, the main uh, uh, console for my cluster, I see three, these are clusters, so are cluster nodes. So I see there's a primary and two secondaries. Now, if for any reason, this primary should go down these secondaries are gonna have a conversation and one of those is going to assume the primary. And then of course, the, the, the original primary will come back online and, and assume the role of a secondary. And that, my friends, is high availability. We do that through replication. When your application writes, it's gonna to write to the primary and then that write will, uh, will eventually get to the secondaries. Now, depending on the availability requirements of your application, you can specify a range of, of how long or short that um, consistency lasts uh, or, or takes to, to flow across the, uh, the nodes in the cluster. So here uh, in this console, you get to see what the activity against your database looks like. Uh, you get to see in real time, uh, we're gonna show the real time when that the next cluster deploys because the real time is not available in the M0 instance. So it's gonna say upgrade to an M10. Uh, you do get to see metrics though. So you can take a look at some really, uh, there's no data because I just recently deployed this. So, uh, but you get to see CPU utilization. You can see all these charts, connections per second, operation execution time, the number of queries, the number of updates, how many connections, et cetera. And then here we can see the collections. So now I deployed a sample data set. This is really cool. So you don't have to come to, my, maybe you're brand new to MongoDB, brand new to MongoDB Atlas, uh, and you don't have an idea of what documents should look like. Well, if you come back here to your main console and uh, you click on the clusters, there's this a little ellipse button. These are my two clusters that are being, the last one's being deployed. The ellipsis is gonna show me something that will allow me to load a sample data set. And when I do that, this is what I get. I get the sample Airbnb, sample analytics, sample geospatial. This is powerful because now I can see what good document schemas look like. And again, here's that JSON object, right? Key value pairs. Each document gets a unique ID and uh, key value pairs. Let's look at restaurants. So you have a couple collections in our restaurants database. I'm gonna go into the restaurants documents into the collection. And here we see an example of embedding. So we've got an array of objects embedded. And this is what your, your database is gonna look like. So uh, again, the, the sample data sets are free. You can, uh, you can deploy those as a part of your, your new cluster. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do when you deploy a new cluster is you're gonna to wanna to add users. So you're gonna to have to have some way of accessing the data, reading and writing the data. And you do that from the security section of the left-hand menu. So I click database access. Now I've already added one user, but I'm gonna add another just to show you how that, how that works. There are two ways, two met authentication methods supported. You can uh, authenticate with a certificate and you can authenticate with a password. Uh, let's add a new user. I'll call this one Kelly and I'll give it a password. Okay, you can also auto generate a password. And here's a cool option. You can make this a temporary user. So we can set this to six hours, one day or one week. And at the end of that time frame, this user will be removed. They won't be able to authenticate anymore. So I'll add that user. Now we've got a couple of users in there and I'm gonna show what it looks like to connect with that users. But before we do that, we're going to have to be able to, uh, we're gonna to have to be able to connect via the network. And I have to do something first in order to enable that access. I have to punch a hole in the firewall. And I'm gonna just delete this because I want you to see something. When you come in for the first time, 
you're going to have to click this button that says add IP address. You're essentially adding an element, an entry to a, to a firewall. And the first time you do it, you're going to see two buttons here. Uh, the first is it's figured out what your IP address is and it, it's asking you if you want to add your current IP address. That's probably the smartest access or the smartest option uh, because if you click allow access from anywhere, anybody in the world can try and hack on your instance. So click the add current IP address. You can give it a comment if you want and you can even make it temporary. So we can make this a temporary six hour access pass from this IP address. Always a smart idea. And that's going to deploy that that uh, entry to the uh, to the three nodes in the server, so we get the same consistent uh, configuration across the board. <clears throat> okay, so now we've added a user, we've added a network. What does it look like in order to uh, to access this this cluster? How do we go about accessing this cluster? There are a number of ways. So <clears throat> the first way is we can click this connect button. And this gives us a nice pop-up with some information. There are several ways that we can connect to our cluster to add data, to read data. Um, we can connect via the MongoDB shell. That's a command line option that you can install on your laptop and use the Mongo command to connect to your cluster. You can connect via your application. So if you're writing a Node.js or a Python or a Java or a .NET, whatever language you're using, we, we can uh, we can have you connect to your cluster from that application. And lastly, you can connect via Compass. And this is, uh, Compass is our, our GUI tool that lives on your laptop and it gives you a graphical user interface for accessing MongoDB. There are a number, number of them out there by various vendors, but we created our own and, and it's uh, probably the easiest way to, to connect. So let's go ahead and click on Compass and it's going to give you a, a command string, a URI to connect. And you can copy that into your command buffer. Uh, make sure that you have MongoDB Compass installed. If you don't, it's going to give you instructions on how to get that. It's available for pretty much any platform that you'd be using. But I already have it installed, so I'm going to copy this into my copy or my paste buffer. And then I'm going to open MongoDB Compass. And here I would click Connect. And I would get this connect, uh, connect dialog box that would come up. And I would put that into the connection string and I would replace it with my user ID and my password. But I've already done that. I've already connected. And this is what that looks like after I connect. Uh, this is really powerful. Okay, on the left, it's showing the hosts that I've connected to previously. Underneath that, we see the databases available in each of those instances. So we have uh, all of our sample data, just like we saw in the Atlas interface. I see all my sample data. And when I click on an, a database instance, let's look at the sample data from Airbnb. So sample Airbnb is the database, listings and reviews is the collection. And here I see all of the documents in that collection. Now I can look at it in object format too. I can change the, the way that it appears on the screen. This kind of looks like a JSON uh, display. We see the curly brace at the beginning and at the end, we even see the embedding. This is kind of cool. Uh, but, and you can even, if you're, if you're familiar with a tabular interface, you can choose to display the information using, uh, using tabs. I prefer the first button here. It's kind of a, a good mix of both. Now this is just looking at the data. You can also affect the data. You can edit the data from this, this tool. So if I wanted to change this here, I could change this to a fake bed and update that and save it. It's gonna save that data right back to the cluster. Um, I can duplicate these documents and I can even delete them. Um, if I wanted to add, I could insert a document. Now note that it's not going to assume the schema, it's not gonna present you with a list of all of the key value pairs. You're gonna to have to re either remember that or paste in an, a document. What I find people doing is they typically just duplicate a document and then edit it. Now, this is great, and that would be worth the price of admission, I think, but the really cool thing is when we look at the schema, and if I analyze this schema, there's 555 documents, it's going to take a look at those documents and it's going to look at each field and it's going to attempt to use the best possible way 
to represent that data. So if it's range data, it's gonna build a little chart here. So you can see the, the ranges of values in that field across all collections. It's gonna sample, so it'll sample a thousand at a time. So you get a pretty good idea. And, and it gets really interesting when we start to look at some of the other types of fields that are available in this collection. So for example, I think we have some address data in here somewhere. Is that in the geospatial data? Yeah, let's look at our shipwrecks and let's, let's look at our schema. We'll analyze that schema. There's quite a few more documents, but now it's recognized in this document structure that we have a set of coordinates. So MongoDB Compass says, wait a minute, now I'm looking at this data in this document and it appears to me to be, let's look at the documents first. This coordinates array in this document appears to be latitude and longitude. It recognizes that this appears to be latitude and longitude. So it says rather than display the seven, nine dot la 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 la, it's gonna say, well, let's put pins on a map because that's how humans prefer to look at uh, geospatial coordinates. Now with a geospatial index in place, I can, I can ask MongoDB questions like, what's the closest or wh what's the, the number of uh, shipwrecks within five miles of, of this coordinate? Um, so MongoDB supports geospatial data right out of the, out of the box. Pretty powerful. If you're uh, interested in, in how your database is performing, you can use the explain, uh, explain plan. It'll execute a, an a explain statement against your database. So you can see exactly how MongoDB is fetching that data. You can look at uh, some performance statistics there. You can look at index utilization. So here we have that 2D spherical uh, geospatial index that we've applied. Uh, you can also, you know, some people that are coming to MongoDB from the relational world say, wait a minute, um, you've got so much flexibility, you can create new field types on the fly. Uh, that's crazy. I want to have some, a little bit more level of a sanity check before we allow people to write to this database. That's where validation rules come in. We support JSON schema in order to do that. And we give you this handy uh, graphical user interface to walk you through the process of specifying what those those rules around the data might be. So that is a really super hyper fast look at MongoDB Compass. There are tons of other capabilities built right into the tool, but I wanted to take a minute and show you what it's like to connect to uh, MongoDB from one of these other mechanisms. So uh, let's take a look at the MongoDB shell. I happen to have the MongoDB command line installed on my laptop. This is what a URI, a, a connection string looks like. I'm gonna copy that into my command buffer and I'm gonna open a terminal and I'm in my webinar directory. Now I've created a, I thought I created a file called .env. Yes, so I can source my .env. And that's gonna put, actually, I'm just, I'll show you what the, what the connection string looks like. So uh, if I paste this in, uh, my username is gonna be Mike. And this is the server DNS entry. So this is gonna connect not to an individual server, it's gonna send this request to, uh, to DNS and it's gonna look at the cluster in order to establish the connection. That's what this plus SRV record is here. So if I, if I hit enter, I'm gonna have to press, uh, uh, type my password. And here we are at the command line. This is the MongoDB command line, so I can do things like show databases. Now think about this in terms of the way that MongoDB Compass works. It already does the show databases here on the left. And then once I use, let's say sample Airbnb, uh, yep, Air, B, and B. And I can show collections now. There's only one. So we'll do this in parity. You see one here. And now I can say db.listings and reviews dot find. I'll find all of them and I'll make it look really pretty. And there you go. Now we can see those documents. And if we want to iterate through the entire list, we can do that. 
but that's all that's all from the command line it's so much easier if you're just clicking on the user interface so so two ways two methods to connect to your mongodb uh cluster and and uh look at the the data that you're storing there <clears throat> oh there's one last way and that's through your application um, you're going to have to have a driver installed now all all of these languages are supported there's uh, native drivers built for each one of these uh, language environments. Let's choose Node.js and the version of 3.0 or later. Look at that. It looks almost exactly like the, the previous um, uh, the connection string. Um, so if you want to get more information about how to code in, uh, code, uh, how to read and write your, your database from Node.js or any language, docs.mongodb.com is a phenomenal resource. There's an, another resource available is university.mongodb.com. We have courses for the operational side of MongoDB as well as the developer side. So definitely check out university.mongodb.com. Let's see, how am I doing on content? Uh, we talked about three nodes, cluster. We didn't talk about MongoDB Stitch and I think we have a couple of minutes. Um, let's talk about MongoDB Stitch. So Atlas is our uh, database as a service. Stitch is our backend as a service. MongoDB Stitch gives you the ability to create an application that lives in the cloud and it's stored natively very close to your database. So if I were to develop an API to expose the data inside that, uh, that MongoDB cluster, um, this is how I would do it. There are third party services that we can create that live in this Stitch app. Let's add one, we'll add a service. Notice there are built-in third-party services for Twilio, for GitHub, even for all of the services that AWS exposes. So, you know, just an amazingly fast way to build a, an application. But let's say I wanted to build a custom, uh, a custom HTTP uh, API, for example. I'll click that and I'll name it, I'll call it API. And I'm gonna add this API service to my Stitch app. Now, I need a way to communicate with this. I'm gonna review that and change, deploy these changes. So we, we can see what else we need to do here. I need a way for my application uh, or my or Postman, for example, to communicate with this Stitch application that I just created. So I'm gonna add an incoming webhook. Now I'll name it, I'll just leave it as webhook. I need an authentication mechanism. I'll let it authenticate as uh, the system because we haven't really created any Stitch users yet. Uh, I'm going to log the arguments, and here is where MongoDB Stitch has created an externally internet accessible URL. So this is how you're going to contact this API. So remember, example is the name of the Stitch app that I created. I created a service, I called it API, and I uh, created an incoming webhook, and I called it webhook zero. If you want to test this, you can test it from curl. And so what happens when I call this, this uh, service? Well, you're going to execute an HTTP method against that service. It's going to be a, a get request or a post request. And that get request and post request is going, I'm going to save this and I'm going to deploy that. This is the function that gets executed when you issue your get over the internet and here is uh, essentially some ES6 that's gonna run. So if I were to use that curl command from command line, I would essentially be running this exercise. So what I didn't do though is I didn't, I didn't give access to this Stitch app to my, uh, to my cluster. One last thing that you need to do is deploy these changes. And then you need to give it a rule. You need to enable access to your sample data, whatever your databases are, for this Stitch application. So let's add one, add a rule. I'm gonna give it access to Airbnb and the listings and reviews. And I'll say that users can read and write their own data. And you add collection. Oh, field name. Oh, we need to specify where the user ID is coming from. So I'm gonna use no template, add the collection. And here's where I'm gonna say, just for this 
demonstration, I'm going to say that anybody can read and write data. Probably insecure, but if you're just exposing an API that's dumping data, that's probably going to be fine. So I'll review those changes. Now we're changing the Stitch application configuration, so we need to deploy those changes out uh, to the cluster, and away it goes. And then from here, we can then run our API webhook. Here's our function. Now, within a function, this is where it gets really powerful. You have the ability to access your cluster natively. So we comment this out. We, we, we do give you the ability to, to do this with very few lines of code. You have a context object a services object and a method to get the data from your MongoDB Atlas service. Here's where we would specify your, your database name, Airbnb. And here's where you would specify your listings and reviews. And you could return that. So here, this doc is going to find one. It's going to use the MongoDB find one command and return that. Uh, we could say return doc instead, return doc. But you can see, obviously, there's, uh, this is super fast, a super fast overview. Um, I do want to leave just a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions. A super crash course in MongoDB Stitch. Um, I want to I tell you that um, I am going to give a talk at mongodb.live, which will happen June 9th and 10th. If this has piqued your interest, uh, in application development with MongoDB, the MongoDB platform. Um, you're going to want to tune into that talk. There's going to be several talks on MongoDB Stitch. I should also mention that you may be confused when you start to see MongoDB.live come uh, uh, June 9th and 10th because they're going to change the name of MongoDB Stitch. MongoDB Stitch is going to become part of the Realm family. So MongoDB Stitch will go away and it'll become Realm. You'll see Realm here where you see Stitch. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I want to jump back over to our content. Let's go back into present mode and make sure we covered all the bases. Yep, AWS Twilio webhook. That brings us to Q and A. Keep in mind, Realm is, Stitch is changing to Realm. And uh, we have some time for some questions. How have we been doing with uh, questions, Brian? Everything good there? Uh, yeah, I think we're good, Mike. I think we're all caught up. Oh, awesome. Oh, wait, two more just came in. Let's see. Uh, this is for you, Mike. Will you be covering PyMongo on June 9th and 10th? I will not be covering PyMongo, but, but we have, uh, I believe we've got the maintainers of the PyMongo project speaking at Dot .live. So uh, Prashant and, um, and Shane are the guys that maintain PyMongo. They're, they're out in the Palo Alto office. I believe they're going to be taking part in Dot .live. Highly encourage you to go to mongodb.com slash world uh, and check out the sessions. There's a, a link at the top of the screen labeled sessions, and you can search for PyMongo there. All right. Another one. Does Compass provide a way to run shell commands? Uh, not yet, but stay tuned. That is, right on. Yep. Right around the corner. Really exciting stuff happening. And that's yeah, I can't wait for question. that as well. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so we've got a 16 gigabyte document limit. Is MongoDB able to store images longer than this capacity or per instance, or for instance, a PDF document? Uh, yeah, we have a, um, a feature called graph. Uh, what is it? So it's eluding me. The, um, uh, GridFS. GridFS, yeah. yeah gra <laughs> yeah. Someone asked about GraphQL, so I was at GraphQL. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. GridFS is a solution you can use to chunk. Basically, you're chunking those those images that are larger than six. And there's a great, there's a great article on the mongodb.com slash blog written by my, my co-host, uh, Nick Raboy, uh, or actually is it, is it, I, I, somebody wrote one and it's uh, mongodb.com. Sorry, it's not on the blog. It's in the developer community, uh, developer.mongodb.com uh, on GridFS. One of the community members wrote an article there. Uh, so check that out. Uh, what else we got here? 
reference uh, architectures. Um, I don't know of a, a, a good solid place to go for multiple reference architectures. Probably the best place to go is the community forums. If you check out community.mongodb.com, um, you're going to register there for an account and there's a, a lot of activity. If you're looking for information on a specific industry or use case, a uh, great place to go and, and chat with other MongoDB uh, users there. Yeah, there's also the modernize link. I, I put that in another answer. Um, it's got some resources on it with regards to migrating that could help there. Great. Uh, stitch over Strapi. Strapi is a very cool little framework. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's an awesome way to, uh, to speed your API development. Strapi is really cool. Now, the advantages of Stitch over Strapi are going to be that Stitch is intimately native. It's, it's built right into the Atlas framework, and you're going to have super fast access to your MongoDB databases, and it's going to automate the process of creating integrations with third-party uh, services like, like AWS, like Twilio, like GitHub. Uh, those types of things. And if there's not a, an API that exists that you want to connect to, you always have the get out of jail free card, which is the HTTP webhook. Um, so whether or not that's better than Strapi, I don't know. I, I, I really, that's probably a very subjective thing. Uh, what else? Uh, can Flutter call GraphQL API? I don't see why not. Um, um, yeah, I would think. I yeah, mean, I haven't personally tested it, but I don't. I haven't tested it either. Yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Flutter, Flutter's pretty cool. Flutter, you, you kind of get trapped in the uh, the Google ecosystem, though. Uh, but I guess if you could use, if you could call, um, you know, your uh, your Stitch app from Flutter, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, Is there a way to test Stitch functions? Absolutely. Uh, it's one of my favorite features as you're developing the the ability to run a little a test run. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, that's built right into the Stitch editor. It's at the bottom. You can um, you can run. You can click run. You can specify documents that you're passing to your Stitch function. Very cool. Uh, Cordova applications. I you know I haven't touched Cordova in a long time, but but essentially that's a you got this. Well, just last time I well you might be alluding to maybe Realm here, and that was another question somebody had was are you going to touch on Realm at all? Which I said you know for that I would recommend anything Realm related. Tune into MongoDB Live in two weeks. It'll go into in depth. We've got a lot of great announcements coming out around Realm. And the last time I checked, though, Realm did not support or code Cordova. Um, so I don't I don't mm -hmm. think the answer is yes there. Yep. Understand how it fits use cases like batch processing or web, app, web application or analytics. I'm trying to understand how we can fit various use cases. So batch processing, um, you can certainly create a batch job that would run maybe via cron or something like that. But we, we also, not to s constantly sell, but we have, <laughs> we have, <That's> my job. <laughs> right? we have um, uh, batch processing built right into the MongoDB interface. You can, you can have uh, functions that are scheduled so you can run these functions uh, and you write those functions in Node.js. So um, we give you all sorts of helpers like that context object, um, right, available in, your, in the context there. So that's for batch processing. But for a web application, you're probably going to use, um, you're gonna use either a call to Stitch or you're going to use the SDK. The SDK um, is available for many different languages uh, but if, like a web application, if you're developing a, a Node.js app, for example, there's a JavaScript SDK for uh, for MongoDB as well as for Stitch that'll that'll speed the process um, of developing for that. Analytics didn't touch on this, but we've got a, a package for that. Uh, if you want to develop uh, charts and and analytics for your data that that lives in MongoDB Atlas, we've got something called Charts. So Charts is built right into the interface within Atlas. Uh, and you can actually export those charts that you create and import those uh, into in an iframe-like sequence into your web application. Uh, how do you specify, oh, do you join foreign key reference? Does it affect performance? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I mean, think about what's happening if, you, if you're doing a join. One logical reference to multiple collections, mul multiple logical collections of data that's going to translate into most likely multiple physical seeks on disk, just like it is in, in the table world, right? If you, if you separate your data into tables and you issue a, a SQL statement that pulls and joins, that one logical read is going to be multiple physical fetches. So yes, and that's, 
that's where the beauty comes in with MongoDB. You get the ability to make the decision based on the read write profile of your application rather than having to normalize your data. Hope that answers your question. Where do you specify column type? Uh, you specify that in your schema statement, in your, in your schema declaration, but, but ultimately you don't have to. <laughs> That's the, uh, the freedom that you get with MongoDB. You don't have to specify a type if you don't want to, but you can certainly use um, an ODM like, uh, like Mongoose, for example. If you want to create a rigid schema, you can certainly do that. Can the schema analyzer and compass effectively parse some standard formats like Datex? Oh, I don't know this. I don't know the answer to this. Sorry. I don't think it can. Uh, it, I know that it can't support XML feeds, but what you may be after is uh, Data Lake. So Data Lake is another feature of MongoDB Atlas. And if you want to store mm, uh, JSON objects right alongside CSV, TSV. Uh, hey, Brian, is uh, XML supported in Data Lake? I believe it is supported in Data Lake, yeah. Uh, I can double check really quick. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know about the ability in Compass to do those things though, sorry. Um, if Realm is not supported in Cordova, would general JS SDKs be available? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, that was rapid fire. Hey, so I really appreciate everybody's time today. I hope it was helpful to you. Again, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be a bit of a salesperson before we go into that poll. Um, <laughs> check out the community. Go, go, go to community.mongodb.com. There's a lot of great folks there. Um, there is uh, the podcast. Please come check out the podcast. Uh, Nick and I have a blast interviewing startup founders. We talk about features in MongoDB, MongoDB Atlas, uh, we give you some great information there. Please check that out and do so. Bit.ly slash WMDB pod to get there really quickly. Uh, MongoDB.live. Did I mention MongoDB.live? It's June 9th and 10th. Um, I have a, a, a session there that I'm going to talk about building something live, going from zero to live in 45 minutes. You can build and launch your startup with free and low-cost services. You can check that out at sketch.co slash b 2 GS. There's the link there. Um, yes. And that'll be a 45 minute session where hopefully you'll get some additional information that'll help you if you're a startup or a founder or a developer uh, looking to, to do the most with the least. I think that's everything. That is all I have. Once again, thanks very much for your time. Oh, check out that poll. Did we get everybody here? You know, we still have 27 out of 53. So please answer that poll, folks. That'll really help us uh, uh, make sure that the content is relevant. Thanks for your help today, Brian. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Oh, we've got another, oh, <laughs> I thought it was a question. Thanks, have a good day. Thank you, Nabil. Great to have you. And there we go, 36 of 36. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.